not usually one for poetry, you know, unless it comes in the form of big hair 80 rock band ballads, but uh, it jumped out at me, you know, and I thought, I thought that was really cool, you know, so I wanted to share it with you guys today. So, that being said, let's uh, dive right in. Today I have a message that the Lord's given me, I'm going to try to do this without breaking it, called uh, Hold On, I'm Coming. And uh, it centers around this uh, this this new year and this and this uh, 2017 uh, pursuing companionship, Jesus and you, and it, it, it centers around this um, the sermon series that we're we're, we're currently on um, called Encounters with Christ, His Passion Living in Us. Uh, the focus of this new series that we're doing is on the numerous encounters that the risen Lord Jesus had with people from the time of um, Easter to the time of Pentecost. Whereas the purpose of this series is to see how we can get his passion living in us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So today I want to share with you my favorite encounter with Christ and how this encounter put the very passion of Jesus inside and living and breathing and, and thriving inside the life of Peter and how this same kind of encounter that Peter had can put this same passion of Jesus living in us today. The specific encounter that I'm talking about can be found in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, uh, where after a night of fishing and catching nothing, catching nothing at all, the risen Lord was set up by the fire and had breakfast prepared for him. And he was waiting on the disciples. But in particular, in particular, he was he was waiting on Peter. Oh, yes. <laughs> Amen? Amen. He, he had an encounter. Waited, he, had, he had breakfast prepared, but he also had a, an encounter prepared for Peter where he was about to put his passion uh, inside of him. So, oh, I want to tell you about that. And I got, I got, I got some real good news today. Number one, I only have three points to make, and, and I'm only going to make two of them, and I'm going to leave the third one to Scott like two, three weeks from now. I ain't asking about it. We're not going to be here too long today, and I know, I know, I'm going to get some amens on that when I'm up. You know. so, amen, my brother Greg. I do want to. Um, I want to give you guys a little bit of. Uh, Backstory there about uh, we're, we're going to go to John 21, but I want to give you a little bit of backstory on the life of Peter. Um, this guy had went to school, you know, to, to learn about walking with the Lord and talking with the Lord and this and that, and he had washed out. And uh, he had he had went to, to work for his father, who was a fisherman. So here he is on the Sea of Galilee out there in the wilderness. It's hot, it's muggy, it's it's nasty. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I do not like fishing. I just, I, I don't like sitting in the boat. I don't like the flies flying around me. The only thing I ever caught when I went fishing was a buzz. You know? <laughs> you know? I never caught anything else. I just, uh, that was it. And you think I would like it more because of that, you know? No, you know? So, uh, anyways, not, not my thing, you know? But so here Peter is. He, he, he's on the boats and stuff like that. He's washed out of school. He's, he's went to work for his daddy. And uh, this leads us to where, where Peter's at in life. In Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 9, uh, we, get a, we get a little glimpse of this. It says, uh, here's, here's Jesus. He's preaching on the shoreline. And he runs into Peter. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. <laughs> then he got into one of the boats. That's just like Jesus just hopping in your car or something like that. I mean, excuse me. You <laughs> know, I find it amusing. <laughs> and he got into one of the boats, which was Simon Peter's, and he, and he asked him to, to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. Now, when he had stopped speaking, he said to, to Simon Peter, Watch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Now what just happened here, is, if I want to pause here just for a second. What's neat is, Peter's a fisherman, man. He knows his business, man. He knows his line of work, man. It's what he's done, man. He's there every day, all day, till the sun's going up, the sun's coming down. This guy's a fisherman, right? And so here comes the preacher. And he says, hey, you know, I know you've been going all night here, you know, and you caught nothing. You went and you fished all night, you caught nothing. Let, let down your nets, man. And so, you know, what are you going to do when the pastor asks you for something? Amen, somebody? <laughs> we, we know when you guys are humble on us, but trust, you know, we hear from, we got a direct line, no big deal, you know. Yeah. Don't worry, you guys got the same line as well, you know. That's 
<laughs> but he says, all right, all right, all right, preacher, man, I'll, I'll, I'll hear you. You know, he says, uh, he says, well, at your word, I'll let down the net. And so when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled the boat, or filled both boats, so that when they began to sink, when, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. Jesus, this, Peter had his own little world, man. And Jesus just, boom, broke right through that, man. Everything that Peter ever knew, man. Just, and, and Jesus does that, man. When he breaks in through time and space and into your little world that you created, and he shows you that there's something much bigger than, than this and much bigger than you going on. Thank you, Lord. That changes everything. Amen. And that, and that changed everything Amen. for Peter. That changed everything. All Peter's, you know, he, he was kind of washed up. Man. His dreams, his hopes, all that stuff was gone years ago. And here comes this man. Here comes this man, Jesus. And he believes him. And he says, hey, you come follow me and, and, and I'm going to make you a fisher of my men. Is what I'm going to do. You, you, you see what you can do. Wait till you, you see what I can do. And so Jesus took this nobody. There's nobody from nowhere, and he did something wonderful with his life the same way that he still does today. Yes. Amen. With us. Thank Amen. you, Lord. That's why Thank I'm you, saying, Lord. Because he took this nobody from nowhere mm -hmm. and it ruined it all. And he did something spectacular with it. Amen. And if you're available, he'll do something with you too. Praise Thank you, Lord. Lord. Yep. Peter went on from this moment. And, uh, man, he just, he really dove in in his walk with the Lord. And when I say walk with the Lord, I don't mean like us today. I mean, literally, these guys walked everywhere. Amen? And they walked in Jerusalem. They walked uh, Bethlehem. It's just walking, walking, walking all the time. It's like uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. That's just all I do. That's just walking, you know? And uh, that's another sermon for another time. Though. But Peter, man, he went in on his walk with the Lord. And uh, he was, he was wanting, Jesus, you know, Jesus had 12 disciples, you know, a, a, a group. But then there was also other disciples. You hear later on where it says, uh, you know, from that time, 120 of them left that day, or this or that. And at other times, he had thousands of disciples. But he had 12 main ones, the 12 disciples. We all know, you know. But of that 12, there was an inner circle. James, John, Peter. Peter was one of the inner three, man. He was really, really cool and close to the Lord. Uh, Peter went on to do other great things. Uh, we're on the spot here. He was there at the, uh, the Mountain of Transfiguration where Jesus brought him up there, and then Moses and Elijah appeared, and, and Peter got to see Jesus in all of his glory, the glory of God, and, and, you know, and, and coming through Jesus. And he, I mean, if anybody had no excuse, it was Peter. He saw it, man. He's like, man, this guy's the real deal, man. You know, he didn't even know what to do. And he started, you know, just jack him up, man. He, he, and you, in that particular instance, you see a religious spirit jump on that guy. And it's not about religion, it's about relationship. Amen. 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 Religion's important. Religion's very important. It's kind of like a garden on the side of a windy mountain. You know, it's, it's there to keep us moving safely in the right direction. But, you know, it's not the best one that's going to get us there. Amen? Right. So it's a relationship. Well, Anyways, he's like, well, well, Lord, let's let's build a tabernacle. Let's 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 build a church, you know, and let's do this. And he's like, no, 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 no. And he even says, Peter didn't even know what he was talking about. But nonetheless, he was there for that. He was there in the garden. He got to see Jesus in his glory, and he got to see Jesus in his agony when he wasn't sleeping. And uh, so he, he he's a part of all these things. And at one time, you know, when when they went when they come to arrest Jesus, you know, just out of nowhere, Peter pulls out the knife, you know, ring, 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 ring. <laughs> on the high priest and cuts his ear off, man. So Jesus was a lot... You know, none of that was going to happen today. Jimmy, you like that, don't you? <laughs> Stop second-guessing letting me up here right now. Right here. <laughs> He's like, you know what? This was probably a bad idea. <laughs> hey. Yeah, I didn't come here to not have a good time. <laughs> all right, amen. I hope you didn't either. Yes, it ain't gonna happen this place. <laughs> anyway, man, Peter was all in, man. He was, he was, he was vested, man. And uh, he was there, uh, and that, he was even the one. He was even the one that when Jesus says, uh, "Who do people say that I am?" And they uh, some the other disciples. Well, some people say you're John the Baptist reincarnated. Some say Elijah. And he asked us all the same question. He asked them the question that he asked us today: Who do you say that I am? Amen. Because that determines how you're going to live your life and how you're going to follow Jesus. And Peter says, well, you're, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And he said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Marjona. He's like, uh, the flesh and blood didn't 
be able to stay in. But your, your relationship with God did, you know? And uh, so this, this, this Peter, who was all in, I mean, he, he had left everything to follow Jesus. He even gets to the point where he says, well, God, you know, even if all these other guys abandon you, I'm prepared to, to follow you to prison and even unto death. Amen. Yes. But man, uh, where, where, where I come from, we got a saying that says, don't sing it, bring it. And when push comes to shove, man, they, everybody scattered and Peter was one of them, right? So here's what happens. Right here in Luke 22, 54 to 62. Now I'm about to show you guys something here. Scott and I were talking in the office. This is when he still thought it was a good idea to put me up here. Uh, we were in talking in the office, and Scott and I, we, we like talking about theological things, like the deep, deep meanings of Scripture and this and that. Scott loves talking about all this stuff. Yeah. Anytime I mean, he likes to go on about any and every subject, the length of hair, speaking in tongues, you know, just all, those, all those things that are non-essential to salvation. Scott loves talking about it. Great length, you know. I'm just getting the eighth time. And on a side note, I'll be putting my resume out this week. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I'm going to be here. Probably good. I'm probably going to be here. I can use a couple of references if anybody <laughs> Now, as we were talking, though, you know, we were just talking about it. And uh, we, it, it, Scott said something, and it made a light bulb go off, you know? And uh, I realized that uh, Peter, when he denied the Lord, he was, he was standing by the fire. You know, he's warming himself by the fire. But then also when the Lord restored him by the, 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 the sea of Tiberias there, when he had the, the breakfast prepared for him, he's also standing by another fire and uh, warming himself by that. So I, I got three fires I want to show you today. And uh, those are the three points. And uh, But we're only going to talk about two of them. So this, this is the first one. This is important. Luke 22, uh, 54. Am I on the right thing? Luke 22, 54 to 62. Having arrested him, they led him, Jesus, and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Let me tell you this right here. That'll preach in itself right there. The moment we start following Jesus at a distance, it's not long before we're not following him. Amen. Amen. Uh, now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him, Jesus. Uh, but he, but he, Peter, he denied him, saying, Woman, I don't, I don't know that man. I don't know him. And after a little while, another song said, You also are, are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then, after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Sure, this fellow also was with them, for he is the Lean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crows. Uh, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, yes. how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. So Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Uh, Jesus warned the guy. He said, listen, Peter, you're no good. You're no good in your walk with the Lord, but with, with, with this, but I'm telling you, you, you know, be sure where you think you stand, at least you might be sinking. He said, uh, before the rooster crows tonight, you're going to deny me three times and Boastful Peter, he says, no, 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 Jesus. The rest of these jokers, you know, I can't speak about them. But, you know, for me, no, I'm, I'm prepared to follow you to death, even to prison. And when push comes to shove, uh, he, he was done. He was done. He denied him. And Jesus even locked eyes on him. How, how heartbreaking is that? You know, I, you know I, I could just see that. So what we see here is that we, we see Peter following Jesus at a distance. But at this point, we're at the first fire. We see Peter warming himself. By the fire of feelings. Amen? Mm -hmm. Up until this point, Peter had a very immature faith. Had a very immature faith. Uh, Peter's faith in Jesus was built upon feelings. Upon feelings. Well, I'm going to follow you even to death. Even to prison. Uh, and us guys in recovery, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'd rather be dead than in prison. Amen, somebody? That's, that's a fate worse than death, man. And uh, G or Peter, he's, he's talking it. But man, uh, you know, we say, I'll take a bullet for you and this and that. But I mean... Metaphorically or literally, you know, and then Peter, it was metaphorically. Uh, so, uh, when push came to shove, those feelings abandoned Peter. It wasn't a solid foundation to be doing that. I ran into a similar problem. I went to, uh, I met Christ in jail. I got released from jail to a program called Teen Challenge. 
Um, wonderful program. It's one of the best things that ever happened to me. But I, I got out. And I like Teen Challenge because Teen Challenge was black and white. You know, it was, this is right, this is wrong. This is in, this is out. But what I didn't realize is, is that God did not send me back in out of the sheltered environment and back into a black and white world. He, he sent me into a shades of gray world. Mm-hmm. And that, that's where he sent me to minister to. And so, man, I come out of here, man, and uh, you want to talk about Peter being zealous, man, I was, man. I said some things I shouldn't have said. I did some things I shouldn't have done. And uh, I made some compromises. And I, and I, I messed up pretty bad. I messed up pretty bad, and I fell flat on my face. And there was a period there of about two years, man, just where after I messed up, man, the heavens were brass. The heavens were brass. I would pray. I'd get on my face on the carpet in my apartment. I would cry. I would cry out from God. God, take this from me. Take this from me. You don't know that um, video we play sometimes, Trust Fall Jesus, you know? Hey, Jesus, you know, the chick, you know, falls <laughs> back. You know, me. Yeah. You know uh, that was the last thing the Lord sent, said to me before he pulled his spirit off me for about the better part of two years, you know? That was the last thing he gave me. That was the last sound of his voice I heard, so I just kept walking in that direction, whether I felt like it or not. But I prayed, and the heavens were brass. I waited for my answer, and I waited, and I waited, and it seemed like it never came. And uh, just everything I did, it was at this point that I started to see my own inadequacies and like everything, and, and the blackness that still remained after conversion, after getting saved. I realized that, man, there's still a lot of blackness in my heart, man. You know, like Peter, he, he'd been following the Lord. He, he'd done good. Things are going good, and it's, it's the same way for us. We're doing good, you know, he washes us, we're clean, we're this or that. But then what happens? We mess up. We yeah. mess up, man. We, we sin for the first time yeah. as a Christian, or we, we fall short on that. And man, it's just like the world's over, man. You know, we believe that Jesus can uh, save us from our sins just so long as we committed them before we got saved. Amen? Mm-hmm. We can't believe that, hey, man, you know, I messed up, and you can actually forgive me now that I'm in the flock, you know? And so... For me, uh, just every, I was at that point, and I, I was questioning my own salvation. Man, am I even saved? Everything I did felt like sandpaper under my skin. Everything got on my nerves. I was just in a really, really bad place. And, uh, you know, uh, I was at a point. I was at a point where I was ready to throw in the towel. You know, I was ready to just give up. And I knew I, I, knew I couldn't go back to drinking because, you know, that, that was a death sentence. That was a death sentence. But at the same time, I just I was like, well, if, Lord, if you don't do something, I guess I guess we're done here. I guess I went too far. I guess uh, there's there's no coming back from this. And I was ready to throw in the town. Now, for most of us, our initial faith, like Peter's here, was built upon feelings. Mine was built upon feelings. I felt pretty good when God took me out of jail and put me in a program, and I felt even better when He took me out of the program and put me back on, you know, in the in, in the field. Amen, somebody. Amen. But all these things, all these experiences, were built upon feelings. And a lot of times, when we come in, when we come into the flock, or even when we've been here for a while, man, we get all caught up in, right. in, in the feelings. Amen. Now, don't get me wrong. I like feelings. I like feeling good. Amen. Somebody. Amen. You know, I like it when you know the Lord comes in like in worship today, man. He's just you know Amen. the waves yes. and this and that. I like that, but I can't let my ship be guided or let the rudder be the rudder of feelings. Right. Right. Amen. Right. It's got to be the rudder of faith. Amen. Or fact from time and experience together, you know, for that matter. Um, you know, when we're when we're when we're, when we're new to this, we're kind of like newborn babies. Amen. We come into the flock, and it seems like. God answers every single one of our prayers, no matter how selfish they are. You know, Amen. It, just, it seems like he just, he's always there. He just he, he might as well have a bullhorn when you first get saved, you know? <laughs> Jimmy, I'm here. It's cool. I got you. Don't worry about it, you know? I don't know what you do that, Billy. That's good. <laughs> good. I like it. <laughs> but it just seems like God is so, so loud. And, I mean, he's just he's just all over you. You know, it's like, oh, I saw God today in the, in the the sunset, you know, I saw God and this and that. But then after a while, those feelings stop coming as frequent when we start hearing the voice of the Lord less and less and less. Amen. And what's going on there is what's called the maturing process. This is this is normal. This is normal. Uh, I wish somebody would have told me that on the front end. <laughs> you know, I you know, but I, I found it in a book. And there's something about something being in a book, you know, where you, you're flipping through the pages and you know, and you're like, oh, thank God. You know, it's normal enough to where someone put it in a book. You know, I'm not the only one. You know, praise Jesus. 
And I found it in a book. This, this is the process. This is what we're supposed to be doing. And it's, it's the maturing process, man. I thought I wasn't saved. I was ready to throw in the towel on this and that. But like with, with a newborn baby, when, 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 when a baby's young, you know, you've got to prepare the meal for it. You've got to feed them the meal. And then, unfortunately, you've got to clean up after the meal, too, if you know what I'm talking about. You know, you're just going to say, that. But then, after a while, you prepare the meal, and then they're able to feed themselves. And then after they get a little older, they should be able to prepare their own meal, feed the meal, this and that. And then uh, even that, after, and as they, they progress through life, then eventually they're going to have kids of their own, you know, and they should be able to prepare a meal and feed themselves in addition to preparing a meal and feeding others. And there's somebody. Right? Amen. Sarah, if you don't know about this, we'll, we'll talk about this later. This is how this thing works. It's going to be cool. <laughs> but it's the same way with Christianity. Eventually, when we first come in, God prepares everything for it, feeds us to it, this and that. But after a while, he needs to prepare it. We need to feed ourselves. That's where your spiritual disciplines come in. Bible reading, prayer, regular church attendance, frequent fellowship with other believers. Um, you'll learn about that stuff in our ASAP recovery meetings. Shameless plug. Uh, and I had to throw it in there. After Joe, after Joe would come up here and say what he said today, Scott, when Joey was up here saying about youth group, I had to. I had to say something. So anyways, um, after a while, though, we shouldn't only just be preparing and feeding ourselves, you know, through coming and hearing the, the spoken word from the pulpit. We should also be preparing and feeding others. Making disciples, amen? Yeah. Are you all with me on that? So it's the same way with God. There's a maturing process that happens when you have a baby, and then there's also a maturing process that happens as a Christian. Because if I got, like, my, my baby, you know, was just, you know, making a mess, throwing a tantrum, this and that, or something like that, and now they're 22 and they're still acting the same exact way. It's no longer cute. It's cute when they're a baby. <laughs> now it's a problem, you know? Amen. <laughs> and so, and that's what we do when we warm ourselves by the fire of feelings. It's no longer cute, you know? It's, it, it, it's a problem. And God has a, a duty as our Father to make us into mature, responsible adult Christians. Amen? Amen. And like with my kid, you know, when she goes out, she bears my name. You know, when people see Brianna, they're like, yeah, that's Pastor Chuck's kid. You know? Mm -hmm. And so when people see us, they should say, hey, Amen. that's God's kid. Well, Amen. So, you know, people are Amen. watching. At some point, though, you know, inevitably, doesn't matter about our upbringing, doesn't matter about our walk with the Lord, we all mess up um, after being saved. Like Peter, um, we're all in need of, of faith, not grounded upon feelings. Um, a lot of us will, you know, and I was in danger of being one of these guys, we'll, we'll start out with a fizzle and then end with a sizzle. <laughs> and then somebody, Amen. And uh, this, almost, this was almost the case for Peter until our encounter. And, and, and this leads us to our encounter. And my second point, John 21, 1 to 18. It's a little bit longer, but I'm going to go through it pretty fast. Um, after, after, now, this is, this is where Jesus' passion started dwelling in Peter. And this is where I believe that we can find Jesus' passion to dwell in us today. So I know when people start reading something of a little bit of length, we tend to go and shut down mode and start thinking about, you know, where Hubert's going to take us for lunch. Hey, that's somebody. <laughs> uh, but, uh, this, hey, stick with me on this part right here, okay? It's just, it's just 18 verses. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two other of his disciples were all together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. I'm going fishing. They said to him, well, we're going to go with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. They caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Now, this is the risen Lord. He had done been crucified, and he's, he's, he's walking around for 40 days. This is the risen Lord. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And uh, they answered him, no, no, no. Echo. <laughs> and he said to them, he didn't have a mic to do that either, Billy. And he, and he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw in because of the multitude of fish. Sound familiar? Yep. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now when Simon heard that, it was the Lord. He put on his outer garment for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the lifeboat, for they were not far out from land, about 200 cubits, dragging the nets with the fish. Then, as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and the fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. 
Simon Peter went up, dragged the net to the land, full of large fish, 153. And although uh, there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you, knowing it was the Lord? Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, like, likewise the fish. Also sounds familiar, you know? This is now the third time. The third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to them, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you, you, you know I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, he's talking to Peter, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. I went to 19 now, I don't know if we have that on there, but it's, it's, I'm going to that. Now what we see right here is our second fire. We see Peter sitting next to Jesus and knowing, knowing that he had blew it, man. Yes. When his best friend was being crucified, some little girl scared him and he ran away. You know? He set him by this fire now. Now here he is, set him by this fire, warming himself by this fire. And it was here we see him warming himself by the fire of forgiveness. Amen? Amen. Jesus had just forgiven him. him. He forgiven him before, but this was the, the public deal. Up until this point, we see Peter on the verge of going back to his old life. He, and, and, and the words he's like... I'm going fishing. He's going back to where he came from. He's going back to the familiar. He's going back to what he knew. He had fingers all over. I done went too far this time. There's, there's no redeeming this. There's no restoring this. There's no fixing this. There's no making it right. I'm going back away. And thank God for good friends. Well, we'll go with that. <laughs> you know, accountability. Amen, somebody. And uh, I'd also like to point out, isn't it funny that the very thing that they were out looking for, fish, that Jesus already had right there waiting, prepared for them on the shore. And also often the things that we're looking for in this life and chasing this life, Jesus is right there waiting for us. Amen. 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 Are we going to wait on him? Or are we yep. going to go out and try to get it ourselves or go back and get it ourselves? Amen. Uh, for me, how do I make those mistakes? And compromise. It's not mistakes. Compromises. In my walk with the Lord, um, I kind of had a Hail Mary. There was this program called the Walk to Emmaus, you know? And uh, I was at the point where I said, uh, okay, I mean, they're not telling me too much about this, but I'm going to go on this spiritual retreat, you know, and, and see what happens. And if, Lord, if you, if you don't show up, then I guess, uh, I guess we're done here. I guess I'm going to go back to the way I came. And uh, I went there. And, uh, man, the first couple of days, God's moving all over the place, everywhere on that property. And, me. Mm -hmm. and so, man, I'm out there, you know, they gave us smoke breaks and stuff. I was still smoking at the time. And uh, I'm out there in the woods mapping my retreat plan. You know how I was like, oh, man, I'm all the way down Route 8 and close to Augusta, you know, at St. Anne's. And uh, I was like, man, uh, I guess we're done here, you know. So I told the people, I, I, was, I, was, I was like, listen, uh, I think God's abandoned me. And uh, even though that's not what Scripture says, you know. But uh, I don't think there's no redeeming this, so I think I, I, I'm being a hindrance. I think I, I should go. And the guy's like, it'd be a bigger hindrance if you left. You know, he's like, just just stay. He's like, hold on. He's like, just hold on. Stick around one more night. Thank you, Lord. And see what happens. Oh, yeah. my God. So I held on. And uh, something happened that night, and I, I can't publicly say it because in our community it's cold and we're not supposed to say it for now. <laughs> they, uh, they're, they're, they're secretive for good reasons but uh, I don't want to ruin the surprise if anybody ever goes but something happened that night something wonderful happened that night 
And it was there that I realized if, if, if these complete strangers are loving me like this and love me, how much more so is he? Amen. And it was there that I come to the point where I was finally able to forgive myself. And uh, the Lord said to me, he said, I heard it just as plain as day, he said, son, I forgave you over two years ago when Amen. you asked me. It just took you this long to forgive yourself. Amen. You know, and I'll, I'll never forget that. Yep. Sometimes, sometimes he has to bring you through the wilderness of the spirit or the winter of the soul in order for you to be prepared to warm yourself Amen. by the fire of forgiveness. And that, Amen. When I come out of Team Challenge, I wasn't ready to warm myself by that fire. And uh, even, even a long time after that, I made I wasn't ready for it. I probably wasn't ready when Scott brought me in. I was a team member. Because days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months. And set it under Scott and I set it under this church and set it under you guys. Uh, I was finally able to the point where I realized it's not about me. I can't do this on my own. I can't go back the way I came. I got a big problem with self reliance. And then somebody, anybody know what I'm talking about? Man, I just, that's the way I am. And I realized it's about grace. It's about grace. Praise God, I thank you for not giving up on me, man. Thank you for having that grace on me, man. I need it. Ever since I've worn myself by that fire, nothing's ever been the same since. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Adrian Rogers, a preacher. Uh, sometimes we're not ready to warm ourselves by that fire. And I love this analogy, and I use it all the time. Adrian Rogers says, uh, we give Jesus Christ the keys of our lives, you know, um, but do we give him all the keys? We're like, here, Lord, you can be in charge of this, 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 and this, you know? And, uh, but, you know, you don't, you don't need that. Here you go, Lord. You Amen. Over of my life. Amen. And so, you don't got to give God all the keys overnight, but you do got to be willing to give them all right. Amen. Overnight. The Holy Spirit's a perfect gentleman. He usually Amen. takes the biggest key, the biggest hindrance, and works on that one first, and then so on and so forth. And that one day, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but one day you will be ready to warm yourself Amen. by that fire of forgiveness. Uh, because once you get a hold of what it is exactly that Jesus has done for you, ain't nothing ever the same again. Amen. Once you get a hold of what it is that you've been forgiven of, uh, nothing's ever the same again. Uh, I hear a lot of people in, in my field or a particular call and say, you know, I used to be up here with the Lord, and now I feel like I'm down here, you know? And uh, just, you know, I had a vibrant prayer life, I had this, I had that, I had, I've even said these things myself, but now I'm, I'm down here and it's not like it was. Um, let me tell you why that is. Because of the process. Because of the process. Originally, your faith was built upon feeling, you know? Uh, I, I feel good about this, I feel like I need to be washed, I feel this, I feel that, you know? But now God's doing something di different. He's doing something bigger. He's doing something deeper. Uh, down there when they were building Newport on the levee, they put these walls up. They had these walls around the property. When they were doing the add-on to the levee, they built these walls up. And I'm like, you know, I'm going down there to visit a guy in the program. There's people in jail, and I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the building to start coming up above these walls that you can't see through. And it just it, it, it didn't come for weeks, months, like in half a year. And then finally, then finally, you know, like one day I'm, I'm coming by, and like there was a, a tear in the fence, and I looked, and they weren't building up, they were building down. Mm -hmm. Y'all follow me on that? Right. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing after we've been in, the, been in the walk for a while, man. He starts digging down, digging down our roots, digging down our Amen. foundation. Right. To where if, when the storms, not if, the storms of life come, but when the Amen. storms of life come. And then that way our, our foundation is solid, man. And Amen. Then the sky is the limit. And so uh, I don't know where, where you're at today, but don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Last week Amen. I came in here and I saw a lot of my friends hurting. I mean, hurting bad. And I just, I was reminded, man, that uh, sometimes, man, it's just a matter of holding on. Yeah. Holding on. Um, you know my favorite thing about Grace Point Community? My favorite thing? There is always a spot here. Scott and I were talking about this week. There's always a spot here for somebody in need of Amen. and grace. Amen. And then you have a spot here. You belong here. I'm just going to say this. Uh, Peter would love the church here. And that's, what <laughs> yeah. that's a fact. <laughs> Don't go back to the old life like Peter almost did. Instead, come warm yourself by the fire of forgiveness. Uh, because when Peter did, it was at this point that the passion of Jesus started living and dwelling in Peter. Amen. And when you allow the forgiveness of Christ, that listen, I got no business sitting at this table. I got no business following this man. When you get a hold of that man, his passion will start to dwell and breathe and, and, and infect others around you. 
Uh, this encounter of grace and forgiveness put the very passion of Jesus living in Peter. We see this when we look ahead to the day of Pentecost and our third fire, which I'm not going to talk about today. That's, that's for Scott next week or in a couple of weeks. But I will, however, say this. Peter warming himself by the fire of forgiveness led to the day of Pentecost where we see him warm, warming himself by the fire of freedom. Amen? Amen. Amen. See him warming himself by the fire of freedom. And the only way to get to the fire of freedom is through the fire of forgiveness. Amen. Amen. We see this when Peter says in Acts 3, This Christ whom you crucified, he's no longer running from the battle. He's running towards it. Amen. And this same fire of freedom that had replaced his, 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 his feelings of fear with freedom is also, that same fire of freedom also added 3,000 to their number that day. Amen. And let me tell you this, 2 Corinthians 3, 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, yes. there is freedom. Amen. Amen. And nothing's, Amen. nothing's ever the same. Uh, and it, it, it wasn't for me. Um, that was my last point, and I just got one thing I want to show you here. That was, that was it. Um, hey, Steve, can you zoom in on this right here for anybody that's watching, watching this at home? This right here is Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's a Christian classic. If you haven't read it, um, I recommend getting a, a modified up-to-date one because when they get into the vows and the dust and this and that, it's, it's over with. But this one I got from today. This, this is this is a yeah. yeah. I'm now say it. what? Yeah. What are you talking about, dude? Yeah, I, I don't mean to do that. Uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. It tells everybody that has been martyred from um, the time of Jesus and Stephen. Until uh, 1563, when uh, Queen Mary, or as they called her Bloody Mary, was martyring Christians. And then it carried, and that's where Fox wrote it, but then they picked up after that. And in particular here, it tells... Has, has, has anybody ever wondered how the apostles died? <clears throat> anybody ever wondered about that? Because that was like one of my first questions, and I was in jail. Like, well, what happened after... I, I read the Bible, you know, start to finish, and I got done, I'm like... Well, what happened next? Yeah. <laughs> what happened to those dudes, you know? And I wanted to know, and this book right here tells you. And uh, it tells about the death of Peter, and I want you to get hold of this, because this, this is outstanding. Uh, I, and, I, and I don't know how accurate it is, but uh, I'm good with the story in the mind test. Amen? Peter. The only account that we have of the martyrdom of the Apostle Peter is from the early Christian writer, Hexippius. His account includes a miraculous appearance by Christ when Peter was old, which was referred to in our John 21 at the end there. Nero, Emperor Nero, he planned to put him to death. When the disciples heard of this, they begged Peter to flee the city, said to be Rome, which he did. Peter still fleeing. But when he got to the city gate, he saw Christ walking towards him. Peter fell to his knees and said, Lord, where are you going? Christ answered, I've come to be crucified again. Uh, by this, Peter understood that it was his time to suffer the death of Jesus that would glorify God. Mm. Uh, so he went back to the city. After being captured and taken to his place of martyrdom, he requested that he be crucified in the upside-down position because he did not consider himself worthy to be crucified in the same position as his Lord. It looks like Peter finally learned his lesson. Yep. That uh, spirit of fear was gone, and that spirit of freedom remained.